Good morning, everyone. Hello, and a very good afternoon to all of you. I'm Sanya Deshpande, a fellow of the current batch of the Young India Fellowship, and I'm extremely delighted to extend a warm welcome to all of you in today's faculty masterclass by Mr. Arun Kumar Singh, Indian Ambassador to the U.S., Israel, and France, and moderated by Anshul Manuja, a YF alum of the 2019 batch. Ambassador Arun Kumar Singh taught us a course called. Deconstructing Select Indian Foreign Policy Challenges and Responses, a Practitioner's Perspective. And it will always be one of my favorite courses at the fellowship. In the past one year, the world has witnessed some monumental and critical international issues. The withdrawal of the American troops from Afghanistan and the current Russia-Ukraine war in the backdrop of an ongoing global pandemic. I feel fortunate to have attended professor's class and received his insights last August when US troops left Afghanistan and once again today in the middle of a war which will most definitely shape the geopolitics of the world for decades to come. I'm really excited to hop on this journey today where we will navigate through key trends in international geopolitics and its implications for India with Ambassador Arun Kumar Singh. Mr. Arun Kumar Singh has served as the Indian ambassador to the US, Israel, France and uh, and France. Throughout his distinguished 37 year career in the Indian Foreign Service, he has served during pivotal periods in key global capitals. He was involved in shaping India's policies, notably the continued progress in the US India relationship, India's ties to Israel, and the formulation and implementation of India's policies related to Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Iran in the period following 9 11. He's also a distinguished non-resident senior fellow in the Asia program at the German Marshall Fund. In 2017, he taught courses on US foreign policy in South Asia and current global trends and challenges at both American University and the School of Advanced International Studies at Johns Hopkins University. He was also a distinguished visiting professor at Emory, School, Emory University and Center for Advanced Study of India at the University of Pennsylvania. Professor has received an MA in economics from the University of Delhi. We're very glad to have you today here with us, Professor. Joining him is Anshal Manuja, a YF alum of 2019 batch and a beloved PA of all the fellows uh, who will be moderating the session today with us. Anshal graduated from Miranda House with a bachelor's in political science before joining YF. She went on to do her master's with the International Relations Department here and stayed on as a teaching fellow for the undergraduates and YF for various, various courses. Her research interests lie in visual politics, humor and memes in conflict, and feminist studies in IR. Before I uh, welcome Anchal, um, before I hand over the session to Professor and Anchal, I would like to brief you about the session structure. For first 45 minutes, we will have a masterclass followed by a Q&A session. Thank you so much. Over to you, Professor Anand. Thank you, Sanya. And thank you for that very generous introduction. I look forward to the interaction today. Uh, as you'd have noted uh, in the class that I uh, taught where you were there, my aim is to keep uh, the sessions interactive so that you know we go with a flow of questions and my comments and um, some of the presentations. But that becomes a little challenging in an online environment. So as you said, we'll, we'll try and keep uh, first 40, 45 minutes uh, uh, for um, uh, what I have to say. And then we'll do some Q&A. And I look forward to Achal who assisted me when I taught the course at YF uh, as my TA uh, to moderate the session uh, thereafter. Uh, in uh, the, the, now I've been teaching at YF uh, for the last four years. And uh, I have structured the course around my own experience. I served in US, served in France, served in Israel, handled issues related to Pakistan, Afghanistan, Iran. So I did a set of lectures around India-US relations and bringing in my personal perspective based on what I saw. A uh, set of uh, talks related to India-Pakistan relations and I was involved in that when I was posted at headquarters uh, on India-Afghanistan. Uh, what are the challenges that means for India? India-Europe. Uh, with a focus on France. And, uh, and again, that becomes relevant in today's context 
with uh, what's playing out in the context of the European security uh, architecture. And then India and West Asia, with some focus on Israel, uh, because again, the India-Israel relationship is very, very important. Uh, West Asia is a very important uh, part of the world for India. A large part of our energy imports come from there. We have almost 8 million people of Indian origin uh, living in West Asia, uh, repatriating 40 to $50 billion annually. Uh, as uh, remittances, which is very important for India's trade and foreign exchange uh, earnings. So that's how we structure it. And I think uh, when all of you uh, asked me to do the class today, uh, I thought I'll bring it all together and uh, do a discussion around something that is very relevant to today's context in terms of what's playing out in Europe. But again, bringing in my personal perspective. So, uh, as you mentioned, I did my MA from, um, uh, from the University of Delhi. And then I taught in Delhi for two years at the university from 1977 to 79. And in 1979, I joined the Indian Foreign Service. Uh, it was a very different world. At that time, uh, it was essentially called a bipolar world. Uh, you had uh, the United States on the one hand and its allies and partners, uh, partners in Europe, in Japan, Australia, and others. And you had the Soviet Union. And today, of course, there is no Soviet Union. People try and ask, what is the Soviet Union? Uh, so uh, on the other side was the Soviet Union, which was a very, very powerful country. Economically, not as powerful as the United States, but militarily in terms of nuclear um, uh, weapons, uh, potential and capacities, a uh, match for the United States. And in terms of the influence um, uh, that it had across the world, uh, so when I joined the Foreign Service, uh, you know, uh, we are asked to choose a foreign language. Uh, you must learn one foreign language and you choose the one you want to learn. And uh, then based on availability and ranking, you are allotted that. And because the Soviet Union uh, was then such a powerful country in the world and also a very important partner for India, I opted for Russian as my foreign language. And then you are sent to study that language in the country where it is spoken, so that you know you pick up the local uh, dialects, uh, the local um, intonation, and uh, so so I went to Moscow uh, to to learn uh, Russian. So I just wanted to show for you to set the context of our discussion uh, what the Soviet Union was all about. So we'll just show you a map. Uh, Achil, can you put up that map? So if you look at this map across the bulk of the Eurasian landmass, what you see in white um, is what was then called the Russian Socialist uh, Soviet Federated Socialist Republic, RSFSR. So that was the Russian Federation, which was one component of the Soviet Union. And all that you see in white and yellow, uh, th that was the Soviet Union. It was made up uh, of um, uh, a, a significant number of what were called semi-independent, although they're completely um, dominated by the structure and the leadership of the Soviet Union based in Moscow. Uh, but they were, you know, they each was called a semi-autonomous uh, uh, Soviet socialist republic. Um, and um, you had in Estonia, uh, Latvia, Lithuania, Belarus, Ukraine, uh, Georgia, uh, Azerbaijan, Armenia, uh, Kazakhstan, uh, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Kyrgyzstan, uh, Tajikistan. These were all so semi-autonomous uh, Soviet socialist republics, which were all a part of the Soviet Union. It was one country. Uh, and although it was one country, as part of the negotiations that the Soviet Union did with the West after the end of the Second World War, uh, because um, a, a large part uh, of the world at the end of the Second World War was dominated by, by the United States, which accounted for almost 50% of the global GDP at that time. So in terms of what the Soviet Union demanded, three uh, of the components of the Soviet Union, Russia, Belarus and Ukraine had seats at the UN uh, in the United Nations, which is again very unusual. Technically part of one country, but treated uh, in terms of purposes of the UN as three countries and three votes in the UN General Assembly 
although in the Security Council, of course, it was just uh, the Soviet Union uh, that was present. Uh, if we can move to the next map. So again, this gives you an idea of what the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, Soviet Union, USSR was uh, at that time. And in 1991, the Soviet Union dissolved uh, in the competition uh, with the US, in the competition with the West, US and Europe. Uh, although the Soviet Union was militarily very powerful in economic terms, uh, in terms of innovation, especially in civilian technology, in military technology, it had matching and cutting edge technology. But in civilian technology, it could not match up with the innovation that was happening in the West. And a lot of people later have argued that a socialist system or a communist system does not uh, quite allow for individual initiative and innovation. Because at that time, uh, whoever was creating the innovation was not necessarily benefiting from it. Now, personally, it was going to the state and everybody had a flat uh, level of income that was being generated for them. So that incentive was not there to bring about uh, innovation. And so, so as a result of that, and due to internal uh, sort of challenges within the Soviet Union, uh, in 1991, essentially, it split up into 15 countries. So today you have independent countries, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania and the Baltic. You have Belarus, you have Ukraine, you have Moldavia. In the Caucasus, you have Armenia, Azerbaijan, Georgia, Central Asia. You have Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan. So this one country splits up into 15. And between 1990, uh, the Soviet Union dissolved in 1991 between 1991 and 2000, uh, basically uh, the, country, the new Russia, uh, which was the erstwhile uh, RSFSR, the Russian uh, Socialist Soviet Republic, became very weak. It had to suddenly move from a communist form of government to a more cap capitalism, giving space for capitalism, free enterprise, that adjustment was not easy. And I remember when I had first uh, served in Moscow from 1981 to 82, uh, at that time, one ruble was equal to $1.33 uh, officially. In the black market, $1 was selling for five rubles. So that was one reflection of the imbalance that was there in, in, in the economy. And later, uh, when I went back uh, to Moscow in 1997 for my second assignment, it was six rubles to a dollar. And in the 1997 financial crisis, it became 28,000 rubles to the dollar. Uh, and uh, then of course they cut off three zeros, it became 28 rubles to the dollar. And today it's trading about a hundred rubles to the dollar. So you can see uh, sort of the imbalance and strength of the, the currencies if you compare with what is Russia today. And of course, uh, with the uh, United States. So, so when it split up in the period 1990-2000, Russia weakened considerably. Uh, it was trying to do this adjustment. It couldn't do it uh, uh, very well. Um, the, the, as they tried to convert state assets into privately owned assets, there was a lot of corruption, cronism, a new, whole new class of people who are called oligarchs. Uh, they emerged to control the economy. Uh, the president of Russia at that time, President Yeltsin, over time became sick. He had other issues. So while this transition was going on, uh, US and Europe were trying to figure out what to do with the security architecture for Europe in the post-Soviet space. So Anshil, if you can move to the next slide. Now, this was the security architecture in Europe in 1990, before the dissolution of the Soviet Union. You had the Soviet Union, and then you had a significant number of countries in Central and Eastern Europe, Poland, East Germany. So Germany, at the end of the Second World War, was divided into West Germany and East Germany. Because at the end of the Second World War, from one side, US, British, French troops were rushing into Germany. And from the other side, the Soviet troops were coming. And they met at what you see here at the border between East Germany and West Germany. So West Germany came under Western influence. East Germany came under um, uh, Soviet Union influence. And uh, they had different forms of government. 
And so these countries, East Germany, Poland, Czechoslovakia, and so that Czechoslovakia today, as you know, is two countries, Czech Republic and Slovakia. It split up uh, post the dissolution of the Soviet Union. Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria, they were part of what was called the Warsaw Pact. Uh, they were part of a military alliance system with the Soviet Union. And what you see in blue uh, were countries that were part of North Atlantic Treaty Organization at that time. And uh, on the extreme, it had uh, Greece and Turkey. And so from the Soviet Union perspective, it had a buffer of several Central and East European countries between itself and the West. And of course, uh, in between uh, uh, what you see in the gray, uh, there is Switzerland, which was uh, neutral. Austria, which was neutral, and of course, um, uh, the uh, Yugoslavia, and again, that's uh, split up into many countries along the Adriatic coast. Uh, so those were neutral. So what you see in gray. So Soviet Union saw for itself um, a buffer uh, between its security and the NATO alliance uh, system. Uh, but after the Soviet Union dissolved, the Warsaw Pact dissolved. And West Germany and East Germany united to become today's Germany. And uh, when uh, in 1990, before the dissolution of the Soviet Union, when it was uh, clear that the Eastern Bloc was dissolving, Soviet Union was weakening, there was a demand uh, among the people in East Germany uh, to merge with West Germany. Uh, there was the you know, famous Berlin Wall um, uh, surrounding the city of Berlin, uh, which was in the heart of um, uh, what was then East Germany, uh, keeping out people of West Germany and East, East Germany separated. That was broken down by the people. And at that time, when the German leaders uh, wanted to unite, uh, the Soviet Union was very reluctant initially to allow that unification because they worried that a united Germany will become very strong. And then it could potentially be another challenge uh, to the new, uh, to the Soviet Union or later to Russia. But at that stage in the discussions that took place uh, between uh, US leaders on one side, German leaders, Soviet leaders on the other side, Gorbachev, one of the things that was mentioned was that they would, NATO would not expand each words even an inch. And now this famous comment of the then US Secretary of State, Jim Baker, has been interpreted in various ways. Volumes have been written about it, uh, articles, books, on whether he said it, whether he didn't say it, what did he mean, what did he not mean, uh, there is no written agreement. Uh, so among the arguments that is made out is that he did not say that the expansion eastwards, uh, uh, or that no expansion eastwards would cover let's say Poland, Czech Republic, Slovakia, Hungary, or whatever. Uh, but only that when you unify Germany, then NATO troops and NATO weapons will not be placed in the Eastern part of Germany. What is today East Germany? Uh, because at that time they didn't even think that you know the Warsaw Pact would dissolve and they would be looking for a new security architecture for themselves. Whatever be the US and Western justification for Russia, they had absorbed that they were promised by the West, US and uh, Germany, that there would be no eastward expansion of NATO. Now, whether the leadership understood it that way or not, this is the narrative that Russia has built since the 1990s. Uh, if we can move to the next slide. Now, this is the North Atlantic Treaty Organization today. So just go back one slide again, uh, Arjun. No, just, yeah, this one. So just capture this pic in your, in your mind as to where NATO was at that time. <clears throat> All right, let's move to the next slide. So you can see NATO has expanded significantly eastwards. Uh, countries that were then part of the Warsaw Pact, uh, countries of Central and Eastern Europe, Poland, Czech Republic, Slovakia, Hungary, Slovenia, uh, Croatia, uh, you have Romania, Bulgaria, and then some that were... Uh, uh, sort of uh, neutral at that time, North Macedonia, uh, uh, Montenegro, Albania, they have all become part of, um, of uh, NATO. And the, what you see in gray now is essentially Switzerland, Austria, and Serbia. 
uh, which is you know one component part of what was earlier as Yugoslavia. So, and not only Central and Eastern Europe, three countries: Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, which were part of Soviet Union and then became independent, have also become part of NATO. And, uh, and the Russian position was that one, there should be no NATO expansion to the East. Second, grudgingly, if the NATO expansion does happen to the East, which they don't like, no former member of the Soviet Union should be included in NATO. Now again, grudgingly, they did not oppose uh, very strongly the incorporation of Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania in NATO, because in these three countries, there was always a separatist nationalist movement, which was anti the Soviet Union, because these uh, countries, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, became a part of the Soviet Union only during the Second World War. Uh, before that, they had independent uh, identities. So there it was seen as okay. I mean, they, they are slightly different from the others. But Russia saw Belarus, uh, Georgia, Ukraine, Armenia, Azerbaijan as very integral parts of the earlier Soviet Union. And their argument was that in the post-Soviet space, there should be no expansion of NATO because they said that threatens our security. Now, the problem was that, uh, as you know, power was a vacuum. And uh, there is expansion of power whenever it does not meet a countervailing power. Now, because Russia had become weak in the 1990s, several of the earlier members of the Warsaw Pact, especially Poland, Hungary, uh, Slovakia, Czech Republic, pushed for them to be included in NATO membership because they had memories of their being dominated against their will and not to their liking by the erstwhile Soviet Union. Uh, in 1956, for example, when there was a democratic movement in Hungary, uh, the Soviet Union had intervened militarily to kill that. In 1968, there was a democratic movement in Czech Republic, and Soviet Union intervened militarily to kill that. So they had bitter memories of the domination by the Soviet Union and wanted to make sure that in the post-Soviet security architecture that emerges in Europe, they are protected from future domination by the Soviet Union uh, because uh, they felt for themselves greater threat uh, from Soviet Union, Russia, rather than uh, the West, uh, Europe, uh, or, or from the United States. So they pushed for their inclusion and they lobbied very heavily in US Congress uh, and the US uh, uh, polity for their inclusion in an expanded NATO. The second thing that happened was that a uh, large number of immigrants from these countries do live in the United States. Uh, and so in the elections that took place in 1996, uh, where President Clinton was going in for a second term, many of these immigrant communities lobbied very heavily uh, and demanded that these countries be included in an expanded NATO. And their votes were very important in some of the critical uh, sort of swing states in the US, in Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania. So President Clinton then came forward with the decision that NATO expansion will happen uh, eastwards and some of these countries would be included. Now, I remember I had been assigned in Moscow as I mentioned from 1997 to 2000. And again, it was a very strange experience. Uh, because when I first went to Moscow, 1981-82, it was the Soviet Union, a communist country ruled under communist system, everything controlled by the state, um, uh, manufacturing was controlled by the state, retail was controlled by the state. And so there were shortages. I know uh, you couldn't talk to people, people were scared of talking to you uh, because there was very strict control system. Uh, your access to officials was very, very uh, limited. Uh, there were only two newspapers really that mattered at the national level, Pravda, which meant truth, and Izvestia, which meant news. And the joke used to be that in Pravda, there is no Izvestia, and in Izvestia, there is no Pravda. And so you had to deal with that um, of, of uh, information that was given out in a very controlled manner. And at that time, again, uh, there used to be two uh, TV channels. Uh, 
uh, Channel 1 and Channel 2. So Channel 1 gave you all the news uh, from the Soviet perspective. And the joke was that when you switch to Channel 2, there was somebody there wagging his finger at you, saying that, why aren't you watching Channel 1? So that, you know, you quickly switched back. So the information flow was very, very controlled. Uh, and uh, availability of products was very limited. And, um, and you wouldn't know what would be available in the shops. So when you were looking for a hammer, you'd get nails. Uh, when you're looking for nails, you'll get a hammer. So you bought what was available and stored for a future, uh, future need at some stage. Now, when I went back in 97, it was a different world. Um, uh, because now it, it was working under a semi-capitalist system. A uh, large number of retail stores had opened up. Things were available, uh, but they were very expensive. And many uh, people uh, in Russia had lost their jobs because the economy was going through a very difficult crisis. So we found professors at universities were now running taxis, um, driving taxis, professors were serving at restaurants, well-known artists were sitting by the river just doing paintings so that somebody would buy. And you could see that they had good uh, sort of um, uh, capital accumulation based on the past, uh, but there was no running income. So they needed to generate running income for their day-to-day -day living. And so it was it's a very... A uh, difficult uh, experience, uh, suddenly you saw theft happening, which you didn't notice in the Soviet Union. There was uh, drug trafficking going on, uh, there were crimes. So in this um, uh, framework of uh, the new Russia, uh, when the, the, um, the West decided that they are going to expand NATO to the East, suddenly there was a feeling, and I noticed that starting about 1997, that the West had decided that the post-Soviet Russia was an adversary. Because till then, Russia was hoping that maybe it can build a more cooperative relationship with the West. Um, that uh, it had lost the Cold War, uh, but it was trying to reform. It was, uh, it was trying to build a democratic society, trying to uh, bring in a more um, uh, free enterprise system uh, of production and trade. And therefore, the West would accommodate uh, Russia more willingly in new security architecture of Europe. President Putin himself said that in 2000, he asked uh, President Clinton whether Russia could be made a member of NATO. And clearly the answer was no, because Russia is a very strong and powerful country. And the uh, US and Europe felt that if you include Russia also in NATO, then Russia will dominate NATO. And therefore, you know, will their security be taken care of the same way? The kind of norms they want to bring in societies in terms of uh, political governance or economic activity, would that be challenged uh, from Russia, which has not yet quite absorbed uh, the democratic or free enterprise system uh, of functioning? So they were very reluctant. But then if you don't build a security architecture along with Russia, Inevitably, Russia will see that the security architecture that you're building is against Russia. So that's the feeling that seeped into Russia. And, uh, and uh, you know, they became very adversarial towards uh, NATO uh, expansion. Now, I remember in 2007, uh, President Putin spoke at the Munich Security Conference, which has become a very uh, important gathering. Uh, for foreign defense ministers, uh, senior leaders from large number of countries, uh, where he laid out Russian grievance with the kind of security architecture that was being built in Europe and saying that, you know, Russia's weakness is being exploited. And this is not going to work in a longer term framework. Um, George Kennan, a very well-known uh, American diplomat, uh, who ha had written uh, what was called famously as the Long Telegram way back in 1949. And maybe you can Google and read it at some time. Basically arguing then that uh, the US would have to have a policy of containment towards the Soviet Union, push back on the Soviet Union. But when NATO expansion happened, George Kennan, in response to a question, said that this was the biggest geopolitical mistake that the US and West was making uh, after the dissolution of the Soviet Union, because inevitably you will build up Russia uh, as an adversary, and that would, that would be a challenge. So uh, after the, uh, President Putin's speech, uh, the next discussion related to NATO expansion happened in 2008. And uh, many of the European countries were very reluctant to expand NATO further to what were the former Soviet Union countries like Ukraine and Georgia. Uh, 
but uh, in the US political system, and so that is the time, so the first waves of expansion take place under a Democrat President Clinton, and the second wave now is happening, the next set of waves are happening under Republican George Bush. And in 2008, uh, the administration of George Bush was not prepared to say formally that, um, that that countries such as Ukraine and Georgia would never be included in NATO, even if they are part uh, of the uh, of the erstwhile uh, Soviet Union. Uh, the many of the European countries did not want to expand NATO uh, further. Uh, France and Germany included. So there was an internal discussion and debate, but eventually, in the statement that came out of the NATO summit in two thousand eight. Although there was no clear path indicated for future membership of Georgia uh, and Ukraine in NATO, the path was left open that at some future stage it could be considered because anything less was not politically saleable in the US. Now, from Russia's perspective, uh, that was like a red light that they felt that this would threaten Russia's security. So, in 2008, when there was an internal conflict, um, in Georgia, uh, Russia intervened in that internal conflict to carve out two provinces of Georgia, Abkhazia and Ossetia, as from the Russian perspective, independent republics. And uh, they, they are really recognized only by Russia. Nobody else um, uh, recognizes them. But Russia's argument was that by carving them out as independent, basically Georgia becomes a conflict situation. And NATO normally does not include in its membership a country that is in a conflict situation because then they have to commit to fight in that conflict. So that, in a sense, has for now stalled inclusion of Georgia. Now, in 2014, when there was a sense that um, uh, Ukraine was gradually moving more and more towards Europe, towards the West, away from Russia, uh, then at that stage, Russia intervened to carve out two provinces or part of two provinces of Ukraine uh, in the Donetsk region, um, uh, in the Donbass region, Donetsk and Luhansk, as at that state, uh, autonomous uh, parts of Ukraine, not under control of the government of Ukraine, but under the control uh, uh, of separatists, uh, sort of uh, in close association with Russia. And you may have noticed that just about a week ago, um, through first a resolution in the Russian parliament and then a decree by President Putin, these two provinces have been acknowledged by Russia as independent countries. Of course, nobody else in the world has done that. And thereby Russia has once again sort of created a uh, sort of territorial conflict situation in Ukraine. And they feel that by this method, they can make sure uh, that uh, Ukraine uh, will not be considered really for NATO membership because the NATO has to commit uh, to fight um, uh, on behalf of, uh, of Ukraine against Russia, which they want to avoid. So, so this was the background uh, in which uh, we see the developments happening today. Now, the question is, uh, why did President Putin act at this time? Uh, because, you know, this has been simmering for a long, long time. Why, why did he act at this time? And there are many theories behind that. The uh, one that uh, he perhaps saw that the uh, current government who was in Ukraine was taking Ukraine even further towards the West. Um, the, the kind of economic uh, agreements that were being worked out, the kind of, uh, although they're not part of NATO, the kind of security agreements and cooperation that was being worked out. So he saw that with that trend going on, um, the Ukraine was moving more and more towards the West and he needed from his perspective to do something uh, to stop that. Uh, the second uh, argument was that um, he saw the West as weak at this point of time. Uh, as you know, the, the US withdrew from Afghanistan in August last year. And this withdrawal from Afghanistan was taken, and it was a very sort of chaotic withdrawal, was taken as an indication of a lessened will on the part of the United States to engage in the interna international context in a robust manner militarily. And that is why even in the case of Ukraine, uh, for example, the US, the West, NATO have said that they will not put any boots on the ground in Ukraine. 
they will not enforce any no fly zone uh, in ukraine and um, but of course they will protect uh, countries that are members of nato and so so again for president biden having withdrawn troops from afghanistan saying that america has been overextended unnecessarily militarily internationally it would be very difficult to commit nato troops or us troops to fight russia in ukraine uh, so so they didn't do that uh, so so that was one sense that uh, the us uh, is militarily uh, doesn't have the same resolve to engage and for at this time he will not meet uh, uh, the same level of uh, sort of uh, reaction and opposition from the west he also felt that perhaps europe was divided in germany there's a new leadership uh, after 16 years under uh, chancellor angela merkel and that they would not be showing their footing uh, france is heading towards an election uh, there are right wing groups in many german in many european countries france germany austria uh, who are sympathetic to russia and even in the united states uh, members of the republican party who are supportive of president trump Uh, have till uh, recently been supportive of president putin and russia uh, one of the uh, powerful uh, media channels in the us fox news several of its anchors are very very pro russia and uh, pro putin so he may have judged that because of divisions in us divisions in europe perhaps there would not be such a major opposition mounted against russia but i think as things evolved uh the reaction in europe was that this was a major challenge that was being done now to the security architecture in europe and that uh, they needed to respond uh, and uh, and that if the leaders did not respond in a significant way uh they would be seen as weak and they would be politically weak uh, in their own domestic context and for president biden Uh, he has been criticized for being weak in the context of Afghanistan. So he has seized on this opportunity to project domestically and internationally that he is strong, U.S. is robust, and that, and then also it has taken the focus away from Afghanistan and all the crit, um, uh, criticism uh, related uh, to the manner of uh, withdrawal from Afghanistan. So what the West has done was that it has chosen a different field for battle. while not engaging uh, with russia militarily in ukraine it has come forward with a whole series of economic measures uh, against russia now these are devastating in their impact the kind of sanctions that have never been seen before uh, the russian central bank has been sanctioned it cannot tap into large part of its reserves uh, in foreign countries and otherwise it had a reserve of 640 billion dollars large part of the assets of russian banks Uh, which were in foreign countries have been seized now for example sverbank and btb which accounts for almost 80% of the assets of the russian banking system their assets ab abroad have been frozen uh, many russian banks have been taken out of the swift system uh, so you know their ability to service payments across uh, borders has become uh, challenged there is restriction on product and high technology products and technology being allowed to go to russia it could have an impact on different industries in russia it could have an impact perhaps even potentially on the russian uh, defense uh, industry so there is a severe uh, sort of uh, action taken economically on the uh, against russia and you can see the impact uh, the rate of interest in russia has was raised overnight from 9.5% to 20% Uh, the ruble uh, declined in value by 30%. Uh, the stock market declined by 40%. And since Monday, there has been the stock market in Russia has been closed. Uh, so this action has been taken. Now we have to see how uh, it plays out in Russia. What is the kind of impact uh, it has there? But of course, it is going to have an impact elsewhere. You know, for example, the US, uh, their trade with Russia is about 35 billion dollars. almost 70 70000 jobs in us are linked to trade with russia so there'll be an impact on that uh, many of the us and european countries that they have invested in russia uh, they will not be able to take out their assets uh, because uh, russia has blocked uh, transfer of those uh, assets the european union has a trade of 200 billion euros with russia and there will be impact on that because we can't pay for uh, trade happening then availability products will get limited uh, many companies will be impacted europe is heavily dependent on russia for energy uh, 
uh, in for example uh, <clears throat> uh, 26% of european union's uh, oil imports come from russia 40% of european union's gas export uh, sort of imports come from russia so there is this heavy linkage and there is going to be an impact uh, there will be an impact on china china's trade with russia is 147 billion dollars uh, and again um, there some part is done in yuan settlements outside uh, dollar euro settlements but that's a very small part therefore the ability to service uh, russia china trade could be impacted there will be impact on india uh, you know our trade with russia is only 10 uh, civilian trade 10 billion dollars uh, which is uh, limited but we import fertilizers from russia and there will be an impact russia and ukraine together accounted for 30% of global traded availability of wheat and that will be impacted now, although we don't import uh, wheat uh, but uh, globally the prices uh, will go up energy prices will go up and oil, uh, that has gone up and that will have an impact uh, on india uh, and as i said we import fertilizers from russia so there will be an impact as a result of that we'll be concerned about defense supplies because even today 60% of our defense inventory is of russian origin and uh, therefore if russian manufacturing is impacted uh, supplies are impacted the supply chain is impacted <clears throat> russia's ability to maintain technological edge in defense their ability to provide servicing and spare parts all that could be impacted and therefore there could be uh, some uh, impact on our defense readiness so again we have to see how <clears throat> Uh, all this plays out. So as a result of this, <clears throat> I think in the coming period, there is going to be a major reordering of supply chains. It already started uh, with US, particularly first targeting China, because they felt that China had exploited uh, the WTO rules and expanded manufacturing uh, by giving subsidies and other things. Uh, in a way to siphon off manufacturing from the rest of the world. So they wanted to change the rules. They started talk of reshoring, onshoring. Then you had the impact of COVID and suddenly supply chains were disrupted and people were talking now of secure supply chains. And what is happening between Russia and Europe and Russia and West is again going to reinforce uh, the push for reordered supply chains. So I think we should expect in the coming period that there will be a major reordering of supply chains, technology partnerships globally. And then, uh, so there'll be new opportunities for everyone, including for India. And I think business people, the government in India will have to figure out uh, what is the reordering that is going to happen and how can we take advantage of that. And finally, many have argued that uh, uh, the way we live, the way we work is going to be transformed very significantly in the coming period. Uh, because of developments in critical and emerging technologies, artificial intelligence, quantum, 6G, cyber, uh, space, biotech. So because of those changes happening again, there'll be completely new norms and standards in production, in technology, uh, new supply chains emerging. So, so for all of you, wherever you are, whether you realize it or not, international developments will have impact on your work and on your business. And if you are able to understand international development and trends, you, you will be one step ahead of those who don't understand these trends. So they will have an impact. You will be able to see the new opportunities that are coming up or avenues that are being blocked. And based on that, I think you can define uh, what you want to do as you enter, uh, you know, uh, sort of uh, your workforce and look for new opportunities. So let me stop here. I thought I'll give you a framework in terms of what's happening and I'll be happy to take questions now. Uh, Anshul, if you could please take this map off the screen. Thank so you. I hope there are some questions. And... Oh, lots, lots. Thank you for the talk, Professor. It's, it's very relevant. And of course, people have burning questions about Ukraine and India. I think one of the uh, major questions that has come up time and again is, is People are asking, what are your views in terms of the future prospect of this crisis? Do you see it ending? And if so, then what is the future that is mapped out post the end of the crisis? So I think the future prospect is not very good at the moment. Um, you know, it is very easy to enter a conflict and much more difficult to put an end to it. Uh, if you look at the experience of Afghanistan, the U.S. went into Afghanistan in 2001. 
and I was assigned in the U.S. starting 2008. And I could see that since 2009, the U.S. was trying to get out of Afghanistan and they were not able to do it. And eventually they left in 2021. And that too, after that, there was a Trump in between who was a completely disruptive president and didn't have the political compulsions uh, of the others. So because where do you declare victory? What is the peg for you to withdraw? And so President Putin has said that he will demilitarize Ukraine because a militarized Ukraine is a threat. He will denazify uh, Ukraine, which essentially means regime change in Ukraine. So get hold of all of Ukraine, do a regime change. But if you do that, how are you sure that there will be stability? How are you sure that there will not be opposition? And the other countries who are opposed to you bordering Ukraine will not supply weapons and other things to the opposition. Now, the Soviet Union itself had intervened in Afghanistan like the Americans did in 2001. The Soviet Union had intervened in Afghanistan in 1979. And they tried to install a government that was friendly to the Soviet Union. They left Afghanistan in 1988, having completely failed in that exercise. And it was the United States, uh, Saudi Arabia, UAE, along with Pakistan, that armed militant jihad in Afghanistan to drive the Soviet Union out of there. So what will be the peg that will enable President Putin to withdraw? We don't know. And it's going to be very difficult. So we, we should expect, look at the destruction happening uh, in Ukraine without getting involved on who's right, who's wrong. Just the destruction, uh, the anguish for people, one million refugees uh, and uh, seven million internally displaced people. The suffering of these people, the families, people being killed, uh, Russians being killed, according to official Russian figures. Uh, and I'm sure the number is much more, more than 500 Russian soldiers have been killed. Uh, and large number injured. So there are tremendous costs and there will be section of people in Ukraine who already said and will maintain that they will never accept uh, Russian suzerainty uh, over Ukraine. So unfortunately, I do not see, and again, the uh, US and uh, many countries in Europe will work very hard, especially the East European countries, Poland, the Baltics, uh, will work very hard to try and make sure that Russia either withdraws or gets bogged down in Ukraine. Uh, and large part, and the other thing is the large part of Russia's military capacity is at the moment involved in Ukraine. And they have left the eastern border uh, with China essentially vacant, uh, perhaps reflecting the confidence in the China relationship, but that is a potential threat. Because in Siberia, which borders China, uh, you know, there are a total of about uh, 15 to 20 million Russians in Siberia. And in just the bordering area of China, there are more than 100 million people. And increasingly, the market in uh, Siberia is dominated by Chinese goods and Chinese traders. So there is a future threat to, to Russia also in the context of Siberia. So it's a very, very difficult situation. But I think, uh, uh, you know, leaders of matter also and... Uh, you know, personal beliefs matter. And I think President Putin has felt for a long time that the Russians and Ukrainians are one people, right or wrong. That's his view. Uh, last year in July, he wrote a 5,000 word essay. Uh, when you have time, just Google it and take a look. And that was perhaps an indication of where we were headed. Basically arguing that historically we are one people. And to say that these are two different countries, two different people is not something that is acceptable. Uh, so I must say, as of now, unfortunately, uh, I do not see any prospects of an early resolution or something that doesn't, uh, you know, lead to further uh, problem and damage. Thank you for answering that, Professor. I think India's abstention at the recent meeting has elicited a lot of reactions. So there are questions about implications of India's way forward uh, in this crisis, especially given... Uh, it's sort of being seen as a revival of its non-alignment. So there are questions about whether that's a viable policy in today's day and age, or is it because of China that we had strategic constraints of the voting? And is India really walking a fine line because yesterday it announced that it will not be buying armaments and defense with Russia anymore, and it's instead going to switch to the US and Israel. So what really is India's path forward here with this abstention and with the recent developments? So I don't think there's been any such announcement, Archer, uh, about India not buying from Russia. I don't think there's been any such as announcement and uh, I don't think the government of India will make that announcement. Because, you know, if you're 60% of your defense inventory is of Russian origin, you need to make sure the Russians remain on your side up to a point. 
because otherwise your defense preparedness uh, will be. I think there was a reference to the comment made by the US Assistant Secretary of State, Donald Lou, in a Senate hearing, where he said that recently India has canceled some orders uh, from Russia. But those were done more for the point of view of wanting to do manufacturing uh, in India. Uh, but again, you know, um, I think uh, India had no option but to abstain. Because if you look at it today, perhaps for India, the most consequential partnership is the partnership with the United States. The United States is the largest trading partner, $150 billion worth of trade. It has increased nine times uh, in the last 20 years. Uh, it is our largest investment partner, largest partner for uh, civilian technologies. It is this uh, uh, sort of uh, largest single country presence of Indian origin diaspora, more than 4 million people in key positions. You know, the CEOs of Microsoft, Google, uh, Adobe, uh, many other key companies, uh, earlier MasterCard, um, uh, Pepsi, um, uh, IBM, uh, the vice president of the United States, uh, six people in the U.S. Congress are people of Indian origin. They are in very, very important positions. Uh, the largest single country presence of Indian students in universities, not Indian origin, going from here, 200,000, it's the United States. So it's a very important partner. And if you take, for example, the IT sector, uh, is very important for India. It generates 9% of our GDP. Bulk of our production in the IT sector is exported. And bulk of our exports in IT sector go to the United States. So it's so again very important for technology development here, for GDP. Uh, so it's a very important partner. We have to keep that in mind. US is still, I mean, it's challenged now more and more Russia and China, still the most influential country in the world. Number of allies and partners it has, for example, in Europe, Japan, Australia. Russia doesn't have the same level of partners. After all, when it is now facing these votes in the uh, UN General Assembly and Security Council. How many countries are voting with Russia? Nobody voted with them in Security Council. Four others, you know, Belarus, Syria, North Korea, Eritrea, are the ones that voted with them in General Assembly. So they don't have that. Even China doesn't have, uh, you know, partners and allies. They have Pakistan and North Korea, but really nobody has. It is the United States. So if India has aspirations at the global level, it has to keep the US partnership in mind. But that having been said, uh, Russia is a very important partner. Uh, you know, in the past, Russia has given you political support when you needed it. For example, on Jammu and Kashmir, including at the UN, when the support was not available from others, including US um, uh, and some of the European countries. In 1998, when we had done the nuclear test, US and UK had criticized India severely and uh, brought about sanctions against India, led a campaign for other countries to sanction India. Uh, Russia criticized India, but opposed sanctions against India. France neither criticized, it did not criticize India and opposed sanctions against India. And that started a new strategic partnership with France. And today our relationship with France is very, very strong. So we have friends and partners on both sides. And it is as a result of that, that um, for India, I think at the moment, there's no other option but to abstain. And by abstaining, although you have not gone along with US and others, you are not supporting Russia. You didn't vote with Russia. You have abstained. You're, and, um, and there's been evolution a little bit in the Indian position. If you look at the statements coming, uh, uh, there were some formulations that were not there in the initial couple of statements, but have now become very regular. Repeated mention of support for sovereignty and territorial integrity of countries. Now, that's clearly meaning sovereignty and territorial integrity of Ukraine. And that's a veiled criticism of Russia. And also that it is unfortunate that diplomacy was not allowed uh, to play its full course. And therefore, again, the veiled criticism of Russia, whether that it did not allow diplomacy completely and that it intervened uh, militarily. So I think uh, given this, uh, and it's not really a question of going back to non-alignment. You know, India has always said, even as it was building the new relationship with the US and others, that India wants to make, maintain the strategic autonomy of its decision making. Because, you know, no country takes a decision to benefit another country. Every country takes a decision based on its own interests. How does it work out? Or how does it work out for the political compulsion of the leaders? So the idea is that India should build its partnerships so that on any issue, 
it takes a decision that is in india's interest not because some other country says that you should take a particular decision and uh, so so that's why it's important so as non alignment became less and less referred to the terminology we used was strategic autonomy of decision making and therefore india must have strategic autonomy vis-a-vis -vis the us it must also have strategic autonomy vis-a-vis -vis russia and uh, so i think that's important as we go ahead and also you know uh, uh, as we face the challenge from china and russia and china are doing more and more together it is important for india to ensure that russia does not go over to china on india china issues uh, because that works for india and last year for example when we had the challenge on the lac uh, at that time uh, from information in the public domain it was clear that russia did not hold back on any different supplies and whatever we needed from russia to deal with the challenge on lac was available for russia so that again is important so i think um, uh, for for the moment uh, abstention is the best option for india on this issue so well, there was also a comment about how circles in us are now realizing that uh, the concept of strategic empathy uh, for countries like india is is something that's coming to the forefront instead of uh, talking about strategic narcissism or strategic constraints because that's a much better way of understanding india's position professor there are a lot of questions also about the threat that russia is actually facing from nato in terms of how viable it is for russia to say that nato does pose a threat to its internal structure and is it legitimate and logical for them to respond to this in a defensive or coercive manner is that the right way to reverse this and also secondly what are your thoughts on ukraine uh, asking to join the european union in this crisis and what will that be what implication would that hold for the world so as i mentioned earlier uh, russia's angst related to ukraine has been on account of ukraine wanting to move in more and uh, sort of uh, closer to the european union and they are opposed to that and if they can thwart it they will try and thwart it now it's a question of where is the power balance what is the structure that is in ukraine uh, <clears throat> in the context of the invasion post invasion do they want to move closer to eu is the eu ready to absorb a devastated ukraine within the european union they may not be ready because in membership of the european union uh, has obligations to everyone because any country that has level of income below a certain level will get subsidy from the eu budget now will the uh, eu members want to do that so we don't know uh, so i think russia will clearly try and stop that uh, but then if as a result of what is happening um, uh, in ukraine if russia is weakened or if there are internal changes that happen in russia then we are dealing with a new situation uh, so short of all that is very very uh, difficult and again on the question of whether russia is justified or not you know ultimately uh, every country decides for itself the west says nato is defensive uh, putin says if you say nato is defensive why did you go into afghanistan or if you say nato is defensive why did you bomb uh, yugoslavia in the 1990s why did you bomb serbia in uh, in 1999 uh, so how do you say you are defensive uh, i remember german chancellor scholz standing next to putin on 15th february said that we should avoid this because this will be the first major war in europe after the second world war and uh, president putin said uh, how are you saying that first major war in europe was when you bombed yugoslavia and you bombed belgrade Uh, or bomb Serbia, so you know there are different perspectives, different interpretations, and uh, so Russia felt a threat to itself. Now, whether it justified or not, and they took an action based on how they felt that threat. Um, no, again, look at it this way: in 1962, there was this major nuclear missile crisis because Soviet Union was looking at placing some missiles in Cuba, and the United States said that they will not accept. soviet missiles in latin america now today for example if russia were to place some weapon systems missiles or anything in a big way in latin america the us would not allow that and that's the argument the russians are making that if you don't allow it you have to give us similar space uh, where we see our security threat but ultimately it's a question of power and when you see international relations you'll find that international relations ultimately is question of building a narrative narrative that others are willing to accept and back up that narrative with power 
if you can't back it with power it has no uh, sort of uh, meaning no because you know for example even in the case of europe uh, us and the west says that every country should be free to choose the security alliance it wants and therefore you know russia can't have a veto but with the us allow honduras mexico uh, choosing a security alliance uh, with an anti us country they will never allow that uh, would we be comfortable let's say if uh, countries bordering india started entering into security alliances uh, with countries that are adversarial to india uh, of course we can't you know help in the case of pakistan but in the other would we be comfortable we would not be comfortable so so i mean russia sees uh, from their perspective that uh, adversarial weapons are close to their borders and it uh, gives them discomfort and they need to address the issue again historically finland opted for neutrality after the second world war to avoid a situation like this austria opted for neutrality after the second world war again to avoid a situation like this so you know you can make the argument depending on the perspective you have depending on the narrative you built and depending the on the power you bring behind that narrative I think we're almost out of time, so we'll just wind up with one last question. Because in the last time we saw the world reach a crisis of this stage in in the Eurasian uh, area was during the Crimean annexation, when there were economic repercussions as well as political. Should we be having a larger debate here on the fragility of the structures that we have sustained for so long and how we see security in the international paradigm that's missing right now? So that debate is going on. because you know the present structure is being challenged uh, in many ways uh, because uh, uh, you know the world has evolved uh, as we started by discussing in 1979 it was a bipolar world in 1990 when the soviet union dissolved it became a unipolar world and for 30 years we've had unipolar uh, situation where essentially the united states dominated and its preferences and it had consequences you know you had the wto now being set up in 1995 which worked for liberalization of production and trade globalization of production and trade because there was one overarching structure uh, usa which was guiding that process now that had consequences uh, china emerged as a strong competitor for the us and so today you have a situation where you have essentially three major powers unless as a result of uh, uh, what's happening in ukraine that changes but you have three major powers you have usa you have russia and you have china russia is economically not a competitor militarily on par with the us china not militarily on par with the us but economically and technologically a competitor as a result of this the global architecture is undergoing change and the us is trying to deal with that you know the whole structure of the quad partnership with india australia japan in the indo pacific is one way of trying to deal with the challenge which of china what they did with aukus an agreement between us uk and australia to build nuclear power submarines uh, for the indo pacific again is the way of trying to deal with china and in europe uh, also now they'll have to find a architecture to respond to what the russia has done and the kind of economic measures they have taken could lead to isolation of russia in a manner that had happened at the time of the soviet union now if this isolation happens will russia become more dependent on china uh, to what extent would china want to be seen to be fully supportive of russia because then it will have a reputational damage in europe uh, and the europeans become more careful in dealing with china and china's trade is heavily oriented you know they have 150 billion dollar trade with russia but 700 billion dollar trade with the us 750 billion dollar trade with europe and so that's something that they would also want to to preserve so i think there are dilemmas on all sides and everybody will have to work their way through this and um, and one of the reason the europeans are reacting very strongly at the moment is because the entire from their perspective the entire post world war security architecture has been based on the premise that there should be no adjustment in territorial boundaries by force because europe has fought wars for hundreds of years two major wars in the last century because of people wanting to change boundaries by force and millions of people have died so they said we should not allow this to happen because once that process happens you know uh, there are claims and counter claims all across uh, europe uh, so so they want to resist that Uh, so, so we have to see. We have to see how this all plays out, and uh, 
where the balance of power lies. So uh, I hope that answered maximum of the questions that were asked in this masterclass. Sanya, over to you. Um, thank you, Professor, for the really insightful session. Um, I think one hour cannot do justice to the amount of knowledge that you bring to the table. Uh, but the consent the issue is very relevant. We all have been tracking the news for the past few days. Uh, the session will definitely be able to help us navigate through the situation, understand it in a better way, uh, understand its implications for India. And we'll be definitely uh, tracking how the situation unfolds in the next few days. Um, thank you, Anshal, for being a great moderator and amazing as always. Uh, and finally, thank you to the audience uh, for asking some really engaging and important questions. Um, thank you, everyone, and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, Archil and Sanya. Thank you, Professor. Thanks, Sanya, so much. Thank you for that generous introduction.